Welcome to the start of Module 5. Throughout this module, we're going to be discussing how stars form, how they evolve throughout their lifetimes, and how they die. In this particular section, we're going to be focusing on the interstellar medium, or the stuff between stars, which is one section out of Chapter 20 in OpenStax Astronomy. Now, up until this point, we've been talking about all of the different ways that astronomers can get the properties of stars from different measurements. In Module 3, we talked about how we can determine a star's surface temperature. We can estimate it based on the color that we can see, and we can calculate it based on the peak wavelength of the spectral curve. We can also learn what stars are made out of by looking for what absorption lines are present in their spectrum. And we can figure out if a star is moving towards us or away from us by looking at the Doppler shift in those absorption lines. Then in Module 4, we added some additional information. We learned how we can get the distance to stars. So right at the end of the module, we were talking about stellar parallax and how, based on the changing perspective of the Earth in different parts of its orbit, we can see stars move against the background and determine how far away they are. We can also figure out how bright they appear to be from Earth, and then once we have the distance, we can calculate their true brightness. Luminosity is the term that we learned back in Module 4 for that true brightness. We talked about how if we can calculate the luminosity of a star, then we can determine its mass based on the mass-luminosity relation that we learned about by studying binary stars. And then finally, we talked about how we can determine the radius of a star, most commonly by figuring out the luminosity and the temperature, and then calculating it using the equation that we saw a few times on our slides. But without thinking about how stars evolve, listing all of these quantities and how we study them doesn't really tell us much about the fact that stars are constantly shifting um, their properties and constantly moving forward in, in a finite lifetime. So this module is all about studying the evolution of stars. How do they form? What determines their lifetime? And what happens to them when they die? How astronomers can predict that. So our story begins with the interstellar medium, and let's jump right into it. So, the interstellar medium is all of the material in space, because although we tend to think of space as empty, and it certainly is more empty than the tightest vacuum that we can make on Earth, there are still clouds of gas and dust. Um, dust is a term that astronomers use for any complex molecules. Uh, and these can obscure or change our view of distant objects. We'll be talking a little bit about that over the course of this video. And the densest clouds of material in the interstellar medium are where stars form from. And we're going to be talking about star formation in this video. Now, for us to talk about the interstellar medium, and I'll be using the acronym ISM, uh, and I encourage you to write that in your notes too to save some time. It is over a trillion times less dense than the top of Earth's atmosphere. So the kind of legal definition of the top of Earth's atmosphere and the boundary of space, uh, the interstellar medium, the space in between stars rather than just within our solar system, that's in between stars space is much emptier. Nearly all of what is out there is gas. So in gas form, simple um, atoms or elements, uh, atoms or molecules. Uh, hydrogen and helium are the most common. The abundances here are shown per 10,000 atoms out there. So hydrogen is found in considerable amounts by itself as H2 molecules. It is also part of many different um, organic molecules that are out in space too. And then there's 1% dust grains, so those are solid pieces of material. Uh, and again, there's, there's not as much variety in the elements as our periodic table would suggest. There's just not a lot of stuff out there. Now the clouds of gas and dust that are found in the interstellar medium are called nebulae. That's a term that we need. The um, singular form of that is nebula, um, and we simply just don't call it nebulas when we have more than one. It's nebulae. It's a Latin plural. There are three types of diffuse nebulae that we're going to be studying um, throughout this section, and we want to make sure that we distinguish 
why they look different and why they truly are different and not just a different way of measuring them. So over the next several slides, we'll be talking about emission nebulae, reflection nebulae, and dark nebulae. So the first one that we're going to talk about is an emission nebula. So emission nebula are found in the presence of hot stars because they are gas that is being heated so much that the gas itself glows. And because most of the gas is hydrogen, and that glow is something that is a specific absorption line that we normally see in star spectra, we are now seeing it as an emission line in this nebula, we know what colors we're kind of looking for, and this particular glow from these hydrogen molecules gives off this kind of pinkish, um, pinkish red glow. So this is an example of the Orion Nebula. This is a uh, large field of view uh, of the whole constellation, and we can see that pinkish glow below um, the belt. And if we zoom in uh, and enhance with multiple wavelengths, we can still see that pinkish red color um, from hydrogen alpha, um, but it's also showing us a lot more additional structure, structure beyond what just visible light um, at broad wavelengths would be able to pick up for us. Now a reflection nebula is a cloud more, more likely to be dust than gas, but certainly a mix, uh, where that dust and gas is not producing its own light, but it is scattering light all around. Now if we think about our um, skies on a clear sunny day, the skies that we have are blue because shorter wavelengths like blue and um, violet are easier to scatter around and bounce around and then head towards our eyeballs. Longer wavelengths like red and orange, they tend not to bounce uh, and scatter as much and so they go in a straight line which is why our clear sky looks blue but sunrises and sunsets look red and orange we receive that extra blue light because it's being scattered into our field of view from this cloud that looks like it's glowing. So the stars are the source of the light, but they're kind of shining on all of the dust grains around them. This example here is the Pleiades star cluster that is moving through a um, dust cloud and is remarkably, um, remarkably good example of this. That blue color is very typical of a reflection nebula. It tells us too though that we want to be aware that when we are scattering all of this blue light, the red light will continue in a straight line. And this is connected to a different topic in interstellar medium study, which is that if we are looking at stars behind a dust cloud, they will in general look redder to us and redder in a different way than being cold stars. Uh, then they should because we're losing some of the blue light and we're keeping the red light. So they just appear um, to our images as being redder. Now a dark nebula is our last type of nebula. So these are much denser clouds. So this is where dust and gas is um, a little bit thicker and uh, can block the light from behind it. This example is Barnard 68, uh, a dark nebula where um, sometimes I've seen there be like articles online on how this is a void in space or it's somehow related in this uh, not so well informed article uh, to being something like a black hole or a wormhole. And it's just a dark cloud. One of the easy ways for us to be able to check that there's just as many stars behind it as there are to either side is by instead of taking just visible light images, we also look in the infrared. Because as we were noting, the longer and longer wavelengths don't scatter as much. So if we're using infrared or radio wavelengths, they'll just make it all the way through the cloud. They're not being scattered um, or absorbed by those dust grains as much. So this is adding infrared light that's been color-coded to red along with visible light. And we see that there's just as many stars behind it. It's like having a cloud on a clear day and the sun goes behind it, um, just being blocked for a bit. So, up until this part of the video, this is the main pieces of information that we want to make sure are kind of in our minds, in our notebooks, whatever we need. You can certainly pause if you haven't written it down and feel like maybe you should. 
but it's worth recognizing that the color in visible light images does a really good job of separating these different types of diffuse nebulae. Uh, and the color is also giving us hints, giving us indications of what the source of light is and what is causing that nebula to be visible. For an emission nebula, it is visible because the gas itself is glowing. For a reflection nebula, it's visible because the dust is being lit up by nearby stars. And the dark nebula is usually visible because it's blocking an otherwise uniform field of stars. So I want you to think for a little bit about how to apply these ideas and these terms with a couple of uh, example images. So this image is a fairly wide field of view, but centered in the image is the Horsehead Nebula. It looks a little bit like a horse head or a knight uh, piece from chess. And I want you to think about which of the types of nebulae best categorizes this nebula. And if you choose other, kind of have an indication in your notes of why you picked other uh, for any given reason. So pause for as long as you need to to survey the image. All right, so if you chose dark nebula, option three, that's probably our um, safest assumption. The horse head is that specific darker, denser looking region in the middle of this overall image. There's a lot of dust and gas with various densities in the constellation Orion, and the flame nebula is nearby um, as well. This image is taken in um, visible and infrared, and so we're, we're seeing colors that aren't quite true to life colors, but it's that dense, darker, central horse head that uh, we were trying to focus on. So the dark nebula would be our best answer here. Here's a second opportunity for us to kind of apply these uh, ideas. So this is the Trifid Nebula in the constellation Sagittarius, and go ahead and pause to think through how you would describe uh, this particular image um, with our types of nebulae. All right, so um, the name actually kind of gives away a hint at what our end goal looks like. Trifid, try for three different things going on. Uh, I would suggest selecting four, where our explanation is that there are three different uh, situations here that we could have the emission nebula part is the bottom um, kind of spherical looking section that is pinkish red. The reflection nebula part is the upper half of the image where we definitely see this blue um, glow from reflected sunlight. And then the dark nebula would be the, um, the clouds that we can see on the edges of the spherical disk, but also kind of filaments throughout it. Um, and that would be denser, darker regions that are blocking some light. So there's all three of those types of nebulae involved. So probably we would pick four to be able to describe that. Now it's worth noting that the hottest young stars that are forming in this area are at the center of that bubble the center of the emission nebula bubble, and they are able to heat all of the gas out to a certain distance, which is why the red pinkish color shuts off. We just get too far away and it gets too cold to make the um, gas glow. But there is still material further out, which is why we start to have that reflected light instead, uh, and that's why the reflection nebula takes over, is because the temperature has dropped. So lots of interesting things going on, and mostly we want to recognize what, what are the kind of key indicators that tell us what nebula uh, types we're seeing. Now let's look back at the Orion Nebula and really zoom in on the central portion of it. At the very center of the Orion Nebula is a stellar nursery, a series of stars that are all forming at the same time out of, the single, out of a single larger cloud of gas and dust. So this nebula is part of a much larger region called a giant molecular cloud. Giant to indicate that it is huge in size, molecular to indicate that it's often very cold, so we've got molecular hydrogen um, H2 molecules, and then a cloud to indicate that diffuse nature in general. 
On the left side of this um, pair of images, we have uh, near ultraviolet and visible, where you can see that reddish glow from interstellar reddening. And on the right side, we have um, far infrared, where we're able to pierce through the clouds and see all of these stars that are forming within all of that gas and dust. When we look at that larger region, we can see that um, one of the belt stars and then down to where the Orion Nebula are, are all showing up with this bright yellow in the infrared, which tells us there's a lot of infrared glow there. The glow of warm, but not um, warm dust, but not necessarily a lot of hot stars. All right, and the um, other really well-known giant molecular cloud, even if we've never heard that term, GMC, um, is the Eagle Nebula. It's also called the Pillars of Creation. Here we see it um, from Hubble on the left and from JWST on the right. Uh, and this giant molecular cloud is um, dozens of parsecs across. So um, we learned about the unit of a parsec. Um, a parsec is a little over three light years. So these are huge, huge things, well beyond the size of our solar system, well beyond the size of many solar systems. And to help us try to picture that, because it's hard for us to, to use a distance measurement we've not really seen before, the mass contained in this giant molecular cloud is a hundred thousand times the mass of the sun. So if this cloud broke down and collapsed and made a whole bunch of sun-like stars, it could make a hundred thousand of them. And the temperature is the same as kind of ambient space, just a few degrees above absolute zero. And that's too cold for there to be much motion or movement. Um, and so the entire cloud is not actively collapsing, but small portions of it are. Small um, little blobs that you might see along the outside of the columns are regions that are beginning the process of star formation. So let's talk about star formation. When we have this smaller, denser region, it can collapse down from an outside um, event. So it can be collapsed down by a shock wave. That shock wave might come from a different nearby star that is exploding. It could come from a um, nearby region that is having star formation and uh, creating new stars, and so we get these winds. There are a significant number of possible uh, causes for star formation that go a little bit beyond the scope of the class. Our main point for our curriculum is that there is an outside influence that has to begin the collapse. Once that collapse happens, though, gravity will take over, and that cloud, that smaller region of the cloud, will condense down and form a single protostar or maybe a binary system in the middle of it, and then a disk of material all around that, which is where any um, planets or exoplanets would form. So these step-by-step -step shown here are maybe um, all of these atoms and molecules in the cloud are about 5,000 astronomical units across. And that is the beginning parts of what will eventually form a protostar. And as the material falls down to create the protostar, it has to speed up and it's spinning and it will flatten out uh, the way that a pizza dough will flatten out. And then our protostar is still much larger than our final star. The word protostar is indicating that it has not yet become a star. It has not yet turned on hydrogen to helium fusion in its core but it will soon. Now we talked through the formation of the solar system. I wanna make sure that we are um, kind of connecting this new star formation with the solar nebula model. So the cloud of material that became the solar nebula collapses down, the nebula shrinks and flattens out, and that's why all of our eight major planets are all in the same relative flat plane and they're all moving in the same direction. And that's where we form all of the building blocks that eventually become planets. Those building blocks are called planetesimals. It is still an open science question on exactly how we go from the small grains to um, planet sizes, but it is something that we can kind of see snapshots of forming uh, planet systems all throughout. So we're going to finish this video here. When we pick back up in the next video, we will be talking in detail about exoplanets since we've now hinted at their formation.
So I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching.